It's the 29th week of 2023. The science and space headlines of the week are... In new research led by a West Aussie, a new type of stellar object has been discovered. India launches Chandrayaan-3, their second attempt to land on the lunar surface. And more evidence found supporting the theory that Mars once had the building blocks of life. Celebrating 20 years of Trekzone, this is Trekzone's Talk and Science. And it is the podcast where you get the science and space headlines now. An international team of astronomers led by Curtin University's node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research has discovered a new type of magnetar helping to further our understanding of neutron stars. It's postulated that the find could be an ultra long period magnetar, a rare type of star with extremely strong magnetic fields that produces powerful bursts of radio waves every 22 minutes, making it the longest period magnetar ever detected. Using the Murchison Wide Field Array in Outback Western Australia, GPM J1839-10 is 15,000 light years away. And lead author Dr. Natasha Hurley Walker is beaming in to discuss this incredible find. Dr. Hurley Walker, thanks for your time initially you weren't sure what you had found yeah that's right um well actually last year we actually found a source that repeated every 18 minutes uh that really challenged our understanding of, of magnetars of neutron stars uh so with this source we actually sort of set out to find it um using the murchison Whitefield array which is a radio telescope here in outback wa uh and we were very fortunate to almost as soon as we switched it on started scanning our milky way uh, searched and found a new source, um, GPM J1839, um, which repeats every 22 minutes. And uh, that's great, you know, we thought, fantastic, we found uh, what we were looking for, another example. Um, but very intriguingly, when we went back and looked through all of the archives of other radio telescopes, we actually found that this source has been on for over 30 years. So uh, it's just been hiding there in plain sight, waiting for someone to detect it. And um, that enormously long activity really challenges the magnetar interpretation. Uh, so it's a really exciting find. I think theorists are going to have a field day when the paper comes out. Absolutely. As you alluded to, 30 years ago, it was found. That was the very large array in the US. Uh, is it a case of missing it or not looking for it? Or we just didn't know what it was? Well, people weren't looking, so uh, the, 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 the radio data that people would have taken at that time uh, was to do a particular science experiment in the galactic plane, you know, look at some beautiful diffuse object, do a very deep image. The kind of radio techniques that you need to find these sorts of sources is to image every single second of the data and look through the data in a, in a, a time series in order to pull out signals that way. And people just weren't looking. Um, there wasn't really an expectation that we could find these kinds of sources. And when you don't know, you don't look. So uh, it was, we found the previous source uh, due to a kind of an experimental project that I gave to an undergraduate. Uh, and uh, he, he found that 18 minute source fantastic. Uh, and this year we had another student project um, improving the algorithms uh, to make these sorts of detections. Uh, and with his help, our team um, made this new detection. So yeah, when it turns out when you look, that the universe is full of interesting things to discover. Well, the finding of GPM J1839-10 is technically the second find of a long period magnetar with undergraduate research student Tyrone O'Doherty, you mentioned him just before, finding the first. You're his honours supervisor, or you were his honours supervisor. What was your initial reaction to that finding? When Tyrone made the first discovery, we didn't know that it was periodic at that time. All he found was uh, a source that was on one month and off a few months later. Um, it took uh, me and a team of other people looking through a lot more data to discover that periodicity. Uh, and I, I mean, I hope Tyrone's watching, but uh, I wish he'd come and done a PhD with me because he probably would have been working on this um, and then uh, he'd be doing a lot more work on it. Um, but uh, as it was, uh, he went off and did a PhD with another group and um, we had a, a, a great time following up the first source and now the second one, which we can see with telescopes from all over the world um, and it's on right now. So anybody in the world can go and observe it, which is very exciting. Now that we have two recorded long period magnetars, how will it shape our understanding moving forward? Well, that's the thing. So magnetars were only predicted to produce radio waves for a short amount of time. They have these very complicated magnetic fields, which kind of periodically get into uh, a state where they can produce radio emission, but that's expected to stop. 
So the fact that we found something that's been on pretty much for as long as we've been doing radio astronomy really challenges that interpretation. Additionally, it's about uh, a thousand times too bright to be produced with the amount of energy that we can calculate that the source has. So that's very intriguing. Where is it getting its energy from? How is it persisting for so long? Um, there's really no great explanation for this at the moment. So uh, I will find out as the community takes our data, which we're going to make all publicly accessible and tries out some new theories. So what's next in the research? Well, for me, I'm going to look for more. So this was a particular campaign that we ran with the Murchison Wildfield Array to search a few thousand square degrees of sky um, every few days for a, a few um, months last year. Uh, but there's other telescopes that we can use. Um, we can also search through the MWA's extensive archives, which go back 10 years. And because of its huge field of view, there's a great chance that we might find more things. So uh, we've already discovered a new pulsar. We've also found um, a whole bunch of other interesting candidates. Uh, so I think that's going to really pay off. I have applied for funding. It would be wonderful if the Australian Research Council would fund me and I will make new discoveries. Absolutely. Looking forward to all of that. Dr. Hurley Walker, thanks for being in uh, to Talking Science this week. Thanks for having me. India's next lunar mission is on its way with Chandrayaan-3 blasting off last week on its month-long trek to the moon. This will be the second time India has attempted to land on the lunar surface and if successful will make them just the fourth country to do so and only the third to operate a robotic rover. This comes just a month after India signed on to NASA's Artemis Accords which document the ways in which member nations will cooperate to returning humanity to the lunar surface and on to Mars. It's it's also 15 years since the first Chandrayaan mission made it to lunar orbit, where it found ice in crater shadows using radar analysis. Four years ago, Chandrayaan-2 attempted to land Vikram on the surface, but contact was lost on final approach to the South Pole. This time around, India will be hoping for a full, uh, full duration mission on the moon, expected to last at least 14 days. Cooler than a campfire and smaller than Jupiter, this brown dwarf star is a rare find. Astronomers at the University of Sydney have shown that a small, faint star is the coldest on record to produce an emission at a radio wavelength. The ultra-cool brown dwarf examined in the study is a ball of gas simmering at around 425 degrees centigrade, cooler than a typical campfire, without burning nuclear fuel. By contrast, the surface temperature of our sun, a nuclear inferno, is about 5,600 degrees. The star's radius is 0.65 to 0.95 that of Jupiter. Its mass is not well understood, but is at least four times more massive than Jupiter. For more, lead author and PhD student in the School of Physics, Kobe Rose is beaming in. Kobe, thanks for your time. How rare is this finding you've made? Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rare finding for us to be able to detect something that is, you know, not giving off a lot of light by itself. And especially when you're considering how few radio stars there are, around a thousand in a galaxy of over 100 million. It's a pretty exciting find. Now, given how cool and light these brown dwarves are, how do we go about finding them? Yeah, great question, Matt. I mean, in the past, because of their faintness, they've been somewhat difficult to find, and especially at radio wavelengths, doing these kind of open targeted uh, or untargeted surveys, I should say rather, uh, of the entire sky haven't turned up a lot of results. And that's because there are a lot of radio sources that we do see in the sky when we scan the entire sky at radio wavelengths. But in this case, what we did was actually looked for circularly polarized light. So light moves as a wave as it moves through space. And that wave can move up and down or side to side. And in some cases, when it's circularly polarized, that means that the wave is rotating or spiraling as it moves towards us. And so what we were able to do was to utilize the fact that very few objects in space give off circularly polarized radio light. Um, so we were able to look at the entire sky, uh, millions of objects, and to uh, detect only a few hundred that were uh, circularly polarized. And this was one of them. Now, this star isn't the coldest ever found, but it is so far the coldest analyzed by radio astronomy. What challenges does that present for you? So in terms of finding them, as I mentioned, it's hard to find radio uh, brown dwarfs, and it's even harder to necessarily uh, pinpoint exactly when they're going to be giving off these flares. So with ultra-cooled dwarf stars, um, generally speaking, the type of radio emission they're giving off is going to be tied to their rotation. So every time the star comes around, it gives off a burst. 
And the thing is, is that this is challenging for us because obviously not every star is going to be perfectly aligned with the direction that we're looking at. So it could be giving off bursts in a direction that we don't see. But more than that, these stars can rotate, you know, between an hour and 15 hours. And so unless we happen to be observing that location for that entire period of time, it can get quite difficult. So we got pretty lucky with this one, uh, originally just doing a 15 minute observation of the entire sky and happening to catch that. Perfect. Now, the star was found in 2011 by Caltech astronomers, and your analysis was made with new data from the CSIRO ASCAP telescope in Western Australia and followed up with observations from the Australia Telescope Compact Array near Narrabri and the Meerkat of Telescope in South Africa as well. How do you collate all of that data and digest it? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question, Matt. It's a little bit hard to digest, I guess, when you consider just the sheer volume of data. But um, what's really great about using these different uh, instruments is that each one um, has a different advantage and can give us a different kind of insight into uh, the physics or, that we're trying to understand. So in the case of uh, ASCAP, the Australian SKA Pathfinder Telescope, uh, what we're able to do is to cover the entire sky um, even from you know the, the limited uh, view of Australia, we can actually cover 90% of the entire sky. And we're building this map of the sky in 15 minute observations. And so that's really good for kind of this general uh, study of the sky to find these objects. But like I said, it doesn't help us uh, understand what's going on on longer timescales. And so what's really great about the uh, compact array, uh, the uh, Australian Telescope Compact Array ATCA and the Meerkat Telescope in South Africa is that we can do these longer follow-up observations with these telescopes and see what the behaviour is like at slightly different frequencies and also over a longer period of time. Awesome, Kobe. A great find, a great read. Thanks for beaming in and uh, looking forward to more Brown Dwarf discoveries. No worries. Thanks, Matt. Fleet Space Technologies has been awarded a $4 million grant by the Australian Space Agency as part of the Moon to Mars Demonstrator Program. The South Australian company will apply the skills and technology learnt from their direct-to-satellite seismic arrays, which are used for resource exploration here on Earth for lunar applications to support crewed missions and locate mission-critical resources. Fleet Space say this will be the first step in the Seven Sisters mission to explore the Moon and Mars for the benefit of all humans kind. The Seismic Payload for Interplanetary Discovery, Exploration and Research Project, or SPIDER, is one of 10 selected to share in the $40 million demonstrator program and it comes just a few months on from Fleet's oversubscribed Series C fundraising round which has dumped, uh, doubled the company value. Well, staying on the moon for another story, and it seems like the man in the moon might be 200 million years older than previously thought, according to international researchers who studied two conflicting systems for dating the surface of, the, of our lunar neighbour. The team from Norway and France found a way of coordinating both systems with their new evaluation showing that large parts of the crust of the moon are around 200 million years older than had been thought. The findings were presented at the Goldschmidt Geochemistry Conference in Lyon last week. The moon is now geologically pretty inactive, meaning that the craters from asteroids and comets which bombarded the moon throughout time have not been eroded away. Earth has received a similar barrage throughout time, but the movements on our surface have masked those impacts. International researchers say the Perseverance rover that's currently scouring the Jezero crater on Mars has found evidence of diverse types of organic molecules. They say hypothesised explanations for the origins of organic matter on Mars include water-rock interactions or deposits by interplanetary dust or meteors, although biotic origins have not been discounted. Their findings suggest that a more complex geochemical cycle than previously thought may have existed in the past. The scan habitable environments with Raman and luminescence for organics and chemicals or the Sherlock instrument is the first tool to enable fine scale mapping and analysis of organic molecules and minerals on Mars. Sherlock is on board the Perseverance rover which landed within the Jezero crater, the site of an ancient lake basin with high potential for past habitability. Signals of organic molecules were detected on all 10 targets Sherlock observed in the crater floor showing diverse mineral association and spatial distribution that may be unique to each formation analysed. 
not only has Southern Launch recently refreshed their brand with the creative work done in-house, but they've also moved headquarters into Australia's premier destination for innovation, as Lot 14 calls it. For more, comms and media manager at Southern Launch, Amy Featherston, is beaming in. Amy, welcome back to Talking Science. The brand new look looks schmick. Yes, thanks for having me, Matt. We're pretty excited about the new logo and um, having an office in Lot 14. It is very cool. Everyone is moving into not Lot 14, uh, except me and a couple of other companies. Well, it's actually a really great place to be because you're surrounded by so many other companies in the space industry and naturally you just work on um, collaborations just happen over a coffee in the in the communal kitchen. So we're so glad to have a, an office there and um, be a part of all those conversations that are happening. And it really is that kind of thing, isn't it, where um, you, if you set up a meeting, it's not as uh, impromptu as, as sort of, hey, we're working on this, oh, well, so are we, let's, let's do a collab. Yeah, exactly. It's such a fantastic initiative from the state government because the where it actually is was our old hospital. So they're these beautiful old buildings that um, they have converted into office space. And so we've kept the heritage of the Adelaide City Centre and then turned it into the most innovative district in Australia. So we're so happy to be a part of it. Very exciting. What else is happening at Southern Launch, Amy? We've got a lot of things on the go. We always seem to be flat out. Um, probably notice we haven't um, got a launch on the cards just yet, but we're hoping um, to announce some more launches coming up towards the back end of this year. Obviously our new logo, uh, we launched um, July 1. Pretty exciting. So the team and I worked on that in-house and we're pretty proud to have it out and about in the world seeing it now. Very, very cool. Any ideas? I know you've just kind of tra uh, beaten my question there, but any ideas yet when I should be looking at flights to Port Lincoln or even Sejuna? Yeah, well, you were out with us for the VSO2 and VSO3 campaigns, so we're just waiting on our customer AT space to um, do some rework on the, uh, the launch vehicle. Once they're ready to go, we'll be ready to go. Um, we are hoping to be out there probably in the fourth quarter of this year, but if any earlier, we'll be set raring to go and get back out there Very um, exciting. probably also got some launches at kiniba on the cards towards the back end of this year so building on our great relationship with the kiniba community aboriginal corporation we're hoping to be launching from the test range so that's possibly going to be the next launches uh, from whaler's way uh the those vs missions again from at space yeah or if if it takes a bit longer for at space it might be something from kiniba so it's a case of watch this space very, very exciting. Well, Amy, we'll leave it there and uh, we'll be keeping an eye out for more news uh, from you guys very soon and uh, be catching up with you, uh, I guess, in quarter four this year. Yeah, sounds great. We'd love to have you again, Matt. Well, a huge thanks to Amy for beaming in. Also, thanks to Dr Hurley Walker and Kobe Rose as well for also beaming in and talking about their stories uh, making headlines on Talking Science this past week. What do you think of this new look, Talking Science? We're now into the 11th season of podcasting, so it's time to expand things out a little bit and not just have me as a talking head for seven minutes. Let's bring in the people making these news stories and hear from them about why we should care and why it's so exciting. So it's the new look talking science. Let me know what you think down in the comments. And of course, we are podcasting on YouTube and across every podcast app. Find each of Trekzone's shows on Google or Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, tuned in and more. Plus, Trekzone's channel in the iTunes library gives you a one-stop shop for all of our goodness. So jump onto your favorite podcast app, find Trekzone and subscribe. On YouTube, membership continues to be available. Early access for less than a cup of coffee per month. Add in behind the scenes of For Your Protection, our new sci-fi series coming soon for the same price as a streaming service, but this way you get a direct, tangible benefit and I'll be paying my actors accordingly. And of course, our social media feeds always have the week's podcast highlights and Star Trek episodes. This is our 20th year to the world. We are Trek Zone. I am Matt Miller, going boldly since 2003.